Greetings, salutations, respect, and love. I am Scott, and you are in the prog corner. And uh, today, man, we're, I'm excited about this one. I've been looking forward to this episode for a while. I even bought a t-shirt for it, the summer of 74. You know, I did uh, this last year for the albums that turned 50, the albums of 1973. And I was convinced that was the best year in the history of music. Well, 1974 might not be quite as good on the top end, but man, oh man, the depth of the uh, greatness in 74, just absolutely ridiculous. When I go through my honorable mentions at the end, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about because I'm pretty sure that all 25 of these albums I'm going to be uh, ranking here are all 10 out of 10. It's absolutely ridiculous. I know over on Sea of Tranquility, Pete Pardo does like one album a day all through uh, January, uh, the albums that turn 50. I'm doing it all in one video, man, and we're starting right now at number 25. It's the Straub seventh album, Hero and Heroin. Oh, yeah, I love this band. Uh... Yeah, it's folk, prog, or whatever, but this is probably their most progressive album. It's Dave Cousins, Dave Lambert, Chris Cronk, or Chaz Cronk. I can never say Chaz. What kind of a name is that, anyway? Uh, John Hawken and Rob uh, Rod Coombs. Uh, uh, Autumn's on this album. I love that track. Uh, Shine on Silver Sun is fantastic. The title track is great. I love Straubs. They got even better once Rick Wakeman left the band. At number 24, it's Tangerine Dreams' fifth album, Fedra. It's the first album they re released for Virgin. It's the first album that had that whole sequencer keyboard sound that they became really famous for, and it started right here. I love Side One. It's a 18 minute long title track, just fantastic. It's Edgar Frost, Christopher Frank, and Peter Bauman. You know who these guys are, and I can make a case that this is uh, Tangerine Dream's strongest release. At number 23, we're going to the Netherlands in Kayak. Uh, call this album Kayak if you want. The first album is called See the Sun. Uh, a lot of people call this Kayak 2. Some people call it Alibi. Uh, whatever you want to call it, I just call it amazing. I am a huge fan of Kayak, especially their first five albums with uh, Max Werner still singing. Just a, a terrific collection of songs. I absolutely adore Kayak. If you like Super Tramp, there's no reason why you wouldn't like this album. At number 22, it's Mike Oldfield and his follow-up to Tubular Bells, Hergis Ridge. His second album, uh, 1973, was a huge year for our teenage hero, Mike Oldfield. He, he shocked the world and sold 50 million albums with Tubular Bells. So how do you follow that up? Well, with the quiet, unassuming little record called Hergis Ridge, I enjoy this record. I think Omadon was better, but uh, this album is way better than its reputation. I enjoy it quite a bit at number 21. I'm going with Artie and Mestieri, uh, their debut album, Tilt. Uh, came out, obviously, 50 years ago. This band is led by the great Luigi Venegoni. The band is from Turin, and yeah, they are kind of a jazz fusion-inflected prog band. A lot of jazziness here. This is their first album, no vocals on it. They added a vocalist on their second album, and then they put out a couple records in the 80s, which were not good, and then they came back like every Italian band comes back in the 21st century, but Tilt is the one you need. That's the album you gotta hear at number 20. It's the international collective that goes by the name Gong. Who is Gong? Why? Oh, man, Gong is so cool. And uh, their fifth album came out in 1974. It's uh, obviously called You. It was the third in the uh, uh, Radio Gnome Invisible Trilogy. Uh, the first one was Angel's Egg in 1973. We were talking about Virgin Records and uh, uh, Tubular Bells. Well, uh, the first uh, of this series, Angel's Egg and uh, 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 Tubular Bells, came out the exact same day. They were the first two releases on Virgin. Uh, and then later in 73, Flying Teapot, and then 74. This thing came out. I absolutely love it. This is kind of like the last go-round of the David Allen version of the band with Gilly Smith, Steve Hillage, Pierre Moreland, who would, you know, assume control of the band shortly thereafter. But a lot of people think you is uh, the pinnacle of Gong's discography. And I agree, although the last two albums with Cavus Cherobi are just amazing. At number 19, it's Refugees' uh, debut in their one and only album, this is a band that was formed from the shadows and uh, from the dust of uh, the nice. 
uh, when Keith Emerson left to join Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Uh, Lee Jackson and Brian Davison were kind of left holding the bag, wondering what we're going to do. Well, how about hire Patrick Mraz and do another album? Just a fantastic release. Later on that year, uh, Refugee would break up because Yes came calling and Patrick Mraz uh, uh, left them in the lurch and joined the great Yes at number 18. We're going back to the Netherlands with Focus and their fourth album, Hamburger Concerto. This was their last great album for a while. Uh, they kind of went commercial there and lost their way. But uh, uh, on this album, you've got the lineup, you know, the great lineup still of Thies Van Leer, Jan Ackerman, uh, Burt Ryder. You got a new drummer for this one. Uh, Colin Allen uh, shows up on this one. He's a fine, fine drummer. And this is a great album. Uh, I love the 20-minute epic on this thing. Uh, Harem Scarum's really good. Fantastic record, uh, great entry point into focus at number 17. It's Peter Hamill in the silent corner in the empty stage, his third solo album. But are these really solo albums when you've got Hugh Batten, Guy Evans, David Jackson, and Nick Potter as uh, your musicians on this thing? You can make a case that all these uh, early Peter Hamill albums are basically just Vandergraaf Generator albums, including 1971's Fool's Mate, which I love, 1970. 73 also saw the release of uh, Chameleon in the Shadow of the Night, a second album in 1974. His Stone Cold Masterpiece. I love this album. Uh, German Overalls uh, was actually part of uh, Van der Graaff Generator's live sets uh, before they broke up after Pawn Hearts. Uh, and then In the Black Room, The Tower, the epic that ends this thing. Just amazing. A great, great album at number 16. We're going to Germany. And no, they're not kraut rock. Don't listen to Wikipedia. I went on Triumvirate's page the other day, and they're calling them kraut rock. Not true. They are a symphonic prog band led by uh, Jürgen Fritz, one of the great, great, great uh, keyboard players of the 70s. And uh, on this, their second album, they get rid of Hans Jörg Pape, and they hire Helmut Kohlen, who appears on this album, and Spartacus. And then he went ahead and committed suicide. Very, very sad. But uh, Hans Bathlet is the uh, drummer here. Man, this is a cool album. Basically, uh, two sides, two songs. Side one is the title track. It runs like 30, 23 and a half minutes. Side two is Mr. 10%. Runs like 22 and a half minutes. Just amazing. And it, it's almost like these guys were listening and, and reading the reviews where they were telling them, oh, you guys sound like uh, ELP. There's a section of Mr. 10% called the uh, Lucky Girl. <laughs> so maybe they were paying attention at number 15. Let's dip our toes into the Canterbury scene, shall we? And the Hatfield in the North's debut album. They only put out two proper albums. This one in the Rotters Club, and then they had a posthumous release later on. Uh, but, yeah, Richard Sinclair, Phil Miller, Dave Stewart, Pit Pile. What a fantastic lineup. And then you've got some guests, man. You've got Robert Wyatt shows up here. And then you've got the Northettes, Barbara Gaskin, Amanda Parsons, and Ann Rosenthal. Just amazing. I actually prefer this one to Rodgers Club. I'm, I might be in the minority there, but I absolutely adore this album. I think it's fantastic. And it just might be my favorite Canterbury album of all time. At number 14, how about Camel's uh, sophomore album, Mirage? Uh, I really like their first album, but this one here, man, they figured it out. They figured it out real quick, didn't they? With songs like Free Fall and Super Sister and Lady Fantasy. I just absolutely adore this album from start to finish. It is my favorite Camel album. I love the Snow Goose. I love Nude. I love Moon Madness. I love the debut, but man, this one here is just unbelievable. You've got the classic line of, of Andy Latimer, uh, Peter Bardens, Doug Ferguson, and Andy Ward. Absolutely amazing. You need it. It's essential listening at number 13. Let's go to Italy and PFM, Premiano for Nernia Marconi, and their third album, La Sola di Niente, the island of nothing or whatever it's translated into. Uh, not as good as the first two. I really like those first two PF albums albums a lot a lot a lot uh, this one i really enjoy but for some reason they throw in an english language song which really throws me off it's uh is my face on straight don't care for it uh 
They did an English version of this album too. So you knew the handwriting was on the wall. Uh, they had done uh, photos of ghosts and then they do this one, uh, The World Is Not The World in English. So you knew that they were really gonna be courting the US and the UK markets. So they hire a guy that sings in English for the next couple albums and the band kind of slowly goes downhill. But I love PFM. Their first three albums are 10 out of 10 to me. At number 12, it's Renaissance and Turn of the Cards. Oh man. Annie Haslam and crew, uh, Tout and Camp and Dunsport. What an amazing band with lyrics by Betty Thatcher. Uh, and this is the album that's got Mother Russia on it. Yeah, this might not be the best Renaissance album. I think that's probably a Scheherazade or novella personally for me. But this has the best Renaissance song on it, man. Mother Russia is so good. I love that track at number 11. Kind of staying with the Renaissance medieval theme. How about uh, Griffin and their third album? Red Queen to Griffin 3. This is right before the band uh, went on tour with Yes. Uh, this is probably the album that got them on the gig because this is an amazing album. Four songs, all instrumental with the crazy, uh, you know, instruments that they use, like the b b bassoon and the uh, crum horns, and you got timpanis, and you got recorders, and it sounds all very old-timey, but it just sounds awesome, man. I love this band, and this is their masterpiece, absolutely. But now we're getting into the top ten, man. These albums, just 1974, dog, just ridiculous. At number ten, it's Frank Zappa's Apostrophe. How is this only at number 10 when you've got that whole side one suite of, you know, Don't Eat the Yellow Snow and uh, you know, Nanook rubs it and Cosmic Debris. And then on side two, you got Uncle Remus and Stinkfoot. What a great album, man. You've got both Fowlers. You've got both the uh, Underwoods on here. You've got Ainsley Dunbar. You've got Sal Marquez. Just a seminal record from Frank Zappa. I love it. And uh, probably his best-selling album, the album that people really kind of identify with Frank. Just amazing. At number nine, let's go to Italy again and Quella Vecchia Locanda. No, it's Quella Vecchia Locanda. Yeah, man, I love these guys. I am so happy that they made it at number nine. It kind of surprised me. I thought it was a little further down, but very, very deserving here. This is their second album, Il Tempo della Gioia. Um, I guess that means the time of joy or whatever. Like I said, their second album. They had an American teenage Kid, Dan Lax, played violin on the first album. He's not here on this one, so it's an all-Italian lineup here. Bands led by the great Giorgio Giorgi. What a great name that is, Giorgio Giorgi. That's my name, man, Giorgi Giorgi. I love it. He's sang, and I guess he plays the flute on the second album, this one here. Uh, this band was formed in 1970 in Rome. First album came out in 72. Their second and final album is this one here. They're both amazing. Uh, they kind of, to me, sound like uh, proto-Kansas, right? Uh, I doubt the boys from Kansas ever heard Quello Vecchio Locanda, but if they did, it would have influenced them. That's for sure. At number eight, yeah, usually we go the you know the one per artist rule or whatever. But we're, you know, when you've got uh, King Crimson putting out two masterpieces in the same year, we're gonna include them both. And at number eight, I've got Starless and Bible Black. Oh, hot on the heels of Lark's Tongues and Aspic. Uh, you no longer have Jamie Muir in the band, so they're a four-piece at this time. So you miss some of the crazy percussion, but it kind of opens the door a little bit more for Bill Bruford uh, to lay things down all by his little lonesome. And uh, the live tracks on here that they uh, intersperse with the studio stuff, just amazing. Absolutely love it. Um, is it as good as uh, the two uh, that book ended? I think it is, man. I really enjoy it, and it's got Fracture on it. What else do you need at number seven, man? It's Todd Rundgren's Utopia, the first Utopia album, and the, and the only Utopia album with this particular lineup. After this, they did a live album, and then they did Raw with you know a whole new set of musicians. So this is kind of like a standalone album. There's nothing else in the history of rock music that sounds like this thing. The icon takes up, you know, all of side two is like 30 minutes long. But side one, you've got uh, the Utopia theme, which is just amazing. I love Todd. This is Todd Rundgren at his absolute proggiest best. Just an amazing album. It's 10 out of 10 at number six. How in the world does Super Tramp's Crime of the Century only make it to number six on this list? Boy, oh boy, I'm telling you, that's how good 1974 was. Just ridiculous. Obviously, their best album, their first two albums, 
didn't move the needle at all. They were commercial failures, but uh, they had a couple little lineup changes and they, they dumped the Dutch millionaire who was telling them what to do. And they just decided to uh, write songs and create a masterpiece. And boy, oh boy, did they ever with songs like School and Rudy and Bloody Well Right. And man, the way this album ends is just so incredible. Yeah, the crime of the century. It's a masterpiece. It's 10 out of 10. At number five, yeah, yesterday we just... Uh, Talked about uh, Gentle Giant in our Sunday live stream. And wouldn't you know it, at number five is The Power and the Glory. Uh, yeah, I love this thing. The third album without uh, Phil Shulman in the band. Uh, he had left the band after Octopus. So, yeah, this is the second album without Phil. My bad. Uh, just an incredible record. It's kind of a concept album about Watergate and whatnot. I even like the bonus track, the title track that didn't make it originally, that they've been sticking on, you know, reissues ever since. But I love this album from start to finish. It's amazing. Uh, I think Gentle Giant put out four perfect albums. And this is one of them for absolute sure. At number four, one of my favorite debut albums of all time. It's Kansas, man. My favorite Kansas album. I love it, man. At Pursue, uh, Death of Mother Nature Sweet, uh, Lonely Wind. Uh, can I tell you, every song is great. There's a little bit of American Boogie and songs like Bringing It Back From Mexico. But who cares, man? This was a band that decided they had their own identity. They figured it out real, real quick, and they stuck with it. I love Kansas. Uh, Robbie Steinhardt and uh, Steve Walsh's voices just sounding so amazing and perfect and beautiful. Beautiful and I, I could go on all day about how much I love Kansas, but I'm not gonna. At number three, it's King Crimson's Red, their second album in 1974. And if it's, you know, it's an album that's got Starless on it, it's clearly uh, gonna be way, way up there. Uh, we no longer have David Cross in the band, so, you know, it's it's the three dudes, right? Uh, so a, a power trio uh, beyond all others, man. Uh, I just wish they would have done a couple more albums in this vein before they broke up. But, you know, Robert Fripp always knows what he's doing. They'd come back like seven years later and put out another masterpiece. Don't you worry. Robert Fripp's always got a plan at number two. Oh, at number two, my beloved, yes. Can't crack the top spot in 72, man. They can't do it. Why? Well, you know why, but yeah. At number two, it's Relayer. Uh, what a weird record, man. A lot of people didn't like Tales from Topographic Ocean, so Relayer kind of righted the ship by aping the close-to-the-edge uh, sequencing and, and, and album structure. But it's a darker thing. It's like in Close to the Edge's darker little brother. Uh, the themes are about war instead of, you know, pie in the sky, philosophical stuff. Side one's all that Tolstoy stuff. Side two is Sound Tracer. Sound Chaser and To Be Over, man, it's a perfect album. It's 10 out of 10. I absolutely love it. Any other year, man, this would have been the best album of the year. But uh, in 1974, a little band called Genesis decided they were going to drop their double album masterpiece. And at number one, it's The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Oh, man. The only album, in my estimation, that can give Tales from Topographic Oceans a run for its money. My second favorite album of all time. And my favorite Genesis album. Clearly my favorite album in 1974. Some people uh, lament that uh, the second disc, sides three and four, are a little unfinished. Maybe not quite as good as the first disc, which was sides one and two. I, and there is a little bit of truth to that. The clock was running. The band was running out of time. So they did rush sides three and four a little bit. But I kind of dig it, man. It gives the, a whole different sound. There's no other album in Genesis's discography that sounds anything like this. And maybe that's part of the reason why. I don't know. I absolutely love it. Now we're going to be looking at some uh, honorable mentions. And you'll see what I'm talking about. About just how amazing 1974 was. These albums didn't make my list. How about Sparks' Kimono My House? They also put out Propaganda that same year. What? Egg, The Civil Surface. I love that band. Uh, Delirium 3. Man, I love that album. ELO, El Dorado. Barkley, James Harvest. Everyone is everybody else. Murple, Iosono Murple. Uh, the first Trace album. Eloy's Floating. Wigwam's Being. Uh, Duncan McKay's uh, debut solo album. Chimera, just amazing. Harmonium's uh, debut album. Uh, Magma, we didn't talk about Magma at all. Rush's debut album. Uh, Steely Dan, Pretzel Logic. Uh, 
Jethro Tull, Warchild, Il Begliero, Del Inferno, Ange, Odella, Dudalim, and uh, yeah, the last five, I guess you could call these number 26 to number 30. I've got uh, Leormi Contrapunti. How did that not make the list, man? I love that. Album. Chicago 7, uh, Hawkwind Hall of the Mountain Grill, uh, and the last painful cut I made. So I guess at number 26 is Robert Wyatt's Rock Bottom. An album I just don't really understand. I love Robert Wyatt, but uh, I think maybe that album's just a tad bit overrated based on the backstory of, uh, you know, the Gilly Smith birthday party and, you know, Robert falling out of a window and being injured and writing the album on a hospital bed. You know, that backstory is really charming and it, and it makes for uh, a lot of great ink, but I just don't think it's as good as my 1 through 25. Just ridiculous. 1974, boys and girls. My hat goes off to 1974. What a great great year, man. Anyway, I love you guys. I'll see you tomorrow when I break down some more prog, not prog, you know, finding the axis point between prog bands and non-prog bands. The last one I did was about post-punk and that was a lot of fun. So I, I'm probably going to go back into the well tomorrow and then we're going to, who knows what we're going to do, man. We're, you know, we're kind of out of the holiday season and we're back and hopefully we'll uh, get back to doing our regular cadence of videos on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and the live stream on Sunday. Monday, but we'll see anyway, man. I love you guys. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join the Prog Coroner Army for as low as $1.99. Memberships are uh, available to all you good folks who want to, you know, help support me and uh, what we're doing here uh, at the number one Prog uh, channel on YouTube. Anyway, I love you guys. Uh, peace in the Middle East. Free Tibet, and uh, God save the king. Save King Chucky. Save him. Save King Chucky. Save him. He wants to be saved. Listen to me. Listen to me, boys and girls. That's not Chucky. That's King Charles III. I'll see you punks tomorrow.